Welcome, everyone. Welcome. We can have you take your seats so we can get started again. Wow. All right. So I'm going to go with. We've. My timer's gone, too. <laughs> All right, everybody. So uh, apparently I get unlimited time because my timer's gone. Where's Seth? Seth, paging Seth. Seth, paging Seth. Somebody go grab Seth. Okay, so. So normally I don't speak at my own events, um, but I, I've been working on something and I, uh, this is new material, this is a book that I'm writing, and so I thought it would be unfair not to present this to leadership. I won't, there's a lot of things I do and, and most of you can hear me if you come to events. And so um, what I'd like to point out, and this, this leads very nicely to what Chris and, um, and Scott are gonna talk about, is the innovation paradox that, that exists within the sales world right now. So the first issue is that, I just wanna go through some data points so that we kinda of understand this, right? The, the first data point is that we, we spent approximately 15 billion in sales training, and uh, when Celeste gets up from CSO, she may correct me on that, because she probably has better data than I do, but this, this came from the LinkedIn State of Sales report in 2018. So, according to InsideSales.com, we're currently spending about $4,500 per rep per year on sales stack. Then, a couple other points. Um, due to CSO Insight studies, the sales enablement space has grown from 29% a few years ago to around 60%. Uh, in the last couple of years. So we'd have, we've had a doubling of the number of sales enablement people. It, let me revise that. We've doubled the number of companies with a sales enablement function. We've exponentially grown the number of people in sales enablement. And this little tidbit that I actually love, this one is the mind-blowing number. According to LinkedIn State of Sales report in 2018, over the last four years, five years, we have increased the number of SDRs by 580%. So we've invested a lot of money on go-to-market strategies and salespeople. Let's see how it all works out. So our friends at CSO have been looking at the trend line for several years and saying, by the way, we've invested all that money, so we've actually gotten an amazing outcome, haven't we? Which is that we've actually reduced the amount of quota attainment over the same period of time. 60% plus of our organization used to hit quota. We dropped to a low point in 2016 of 53%. We went up in 2018 to 54%, but approximately half of our salespeople can't get the job done. Now, I'd call that a paradox, wouldn't you? We're investing in training, we're investing in technology, we're investing in enablement, and we're losing the game. So, and then this little one beautiful tidbit. This is a Gong. I, I'm, not, I'm gonna, not gonna vouch for their data, but I, I like the, uh, the point is they're saying that according to their research from 2010 to 2017, we've gone from 26 months average tenure of a VP of sales to now 19 months. So not only are we not doing well, we're changing our leadership pretty consistently just to make it more interesting, right? So this is the landscape in which we're operating. So I've been looking at this for about four to five years. Actually, my interest came from this concept of innovation. 
technology enhancing the capacity of the salesperson should be creating what Microsoft described this morning as a multiplier effect. And yet, instead of seeing a multiplier effect, what we're actually seeing is a reduction in efficacy of effort. Why? What's going on? So I would break this down into two components. For lack of a better acronym, once again, the book is not published, it's in the design phase, we're calling it TIBS, right? Technology innovation is one component and then behavioral shift is the second component. So we see technological change in the consumer sector, we would call this FANG, the FANG stocks, we'll go over them and kind of describe what the customer has been experiencing over the last few years. And then in the commercial environment, we've had the SaaS explosion. Software as a service added by VC capital creates a sales stack explosion of hundreds and hundreds of apps available to increase the performance of our salespeople. Now, along with that, we don't stay the same, right? We begin to change behaviorally. And so the three components of behavioral shift would be that sellers change, buyers change, and organizations change. So let's go through this a little bit. First, let's start with the customer and the FANG analysis. So first thing, the FANG stocks, right? We've got Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and Google. Let's talk about Facebook. We're all social creatures, right? If it isn't on social, it didn't happen, depending on your generation, right? So Facebook has definitely changed the way we act, the way we operate the social concepts, we tend to be constructed more digitally than we are personally. This has actually been good and bad, right? But it changes the very nature of the way we operate. Amazon, their last quarterly earnings were down because they're investing in one day delivery. Not two day delivery, one day delivery. So, by the way, I was just, just to give you a, a personal story, so my dryer broke over the summer. In Texas, that really doesn't matter, right? If, if your dryer breaks, breaks in the summer, you just put up a line and within five minutes you're dry, and, um, except I have allergies, so that's not a good strategy. And so, um, so I, I, you know, I, I did what most normal people would do. I went to Google and said my dryer no longer heats, and there was this guy who showed me that my Samsung, very expensive $1,000 dryer had this really inexpensive piece of metal that breaks very easily down in the front part of the dryer that is easily moved out and replaced for about 20 bucks. So I looked at my wife and I said, I really don't know how to fix a dryer, but for 20 bucks and two days, let's try this. So I got the part, I switched out the heating element, and I am a genius. <laughs> what happened to the repairman or woman? Did they even get a phone call? Did I buy a new dryer? No, I can fix that. I thought I was good as a professor. Apparently, I got, but as karma would go, I now have three appliances at my home that are broken, and this, this process did not work for the other three, so um, I guess it came back to get me, right? So Apple, Apple, let's talk about mobile. We're now in a mobile economy. My wife, it's interesting, a few years ago, I got her her first iPhone, and she looked at, me and she said, I don't know why I would ever need this. And I said, honey, it's very, very nice. You'll, you'll want that. And six months later, she looked at me once and she said, I just need you to know something. If you ever die, I think I'll be okay. But if I lose that iPhone, I need another one immediately. <laughs> Behaviorally changed, would you say, right? It became an integral part of her being. We walk around with a supercomputer in our pocket that allows us to press buttons and watch TV shows wherever we want to be, allows us to ask search, and voice now is becoming the next generation. We can ask Siri, we can ask Alexa, 
or we can ask Google, I kind of think Siri's dumb, I think Google is creepy because Google's in every part of my house and occasionally interrupts our conversations, right? It's like, uh, hey Google, you're not supposed to be listening right now, right? So we're in a different world and this is all happening to the buyer. The buyer is sitting and experiencing all these changes as a consumer and then they go to work and they try to buy something at work. Is it click, buy at work? Not yet, right? We have buying processes and challenges to buy, and yet we go home and we can click, and something's on our doorstep within 48 hours, 24 hours, sometimes even same day. So this has changed the way our buyers are perceiving the way the market should be, but are we following up with our organizational buying structures and are we following up with our selling structures? So then, when we look at this, now let's talk about the salespeople. So we've got the salesperson. It's a handsome young man, isn't it? He's my son. So here's a salesperson, and this is Nancy Narden's um, sales landscape. Currently, 700 different point solutions that could enhance the ability of the salesperson to do the job. A few years ago, I would have a keynote that would describe the fact that we might actually be able to have Iron Man suits. I'd like to propose we are in Iron Man suits today, unless we're behind. If we're adding all the technology, then we have the capacity to do things much faster with a lot more intelligence. So, now let's think about this for a second. We've moved from an interaction in which we have a human being contacting a customer, and now we have the Iron Man suit now talking to the customer. So the salesperson looks drastically different, is operating drastically different with automated and augmented concepts, but the buyer to our perception is the same old person. We perceive that the buyer is just the buyer. But the buyer is not the same buyer, they've been fanged, right? They're very, very different. Just like we're very, very different. So we've actually changed everything. So to help you kind of understand this, I'd like to go to, um, my family were huge Lord of the Rings fans. Um, if you don't know what Lord of the Rings are, we're sorry. You just won't be able to communicate with any of us. Um, it's a trilogy that was written by Tolkien, and there's, there's actually three movies. If you didn't know this, there's the uncut version, which you can watch over nine hours. Our family, every Christmas, starts that series and watches the nine-hour series. And so this is from kind of the middle journey, and this is the, the kingdom of Rohan. Now, Rohan are the horse, the horse people, right? They're, they are the horse warriors, so they, they roam out into the vast beyond, and as you can see, this is the seat of their government. It's uh, fairly indefensible. I mean, if you wanted to go attack that, I think you could take it out pretty easily. So in the story, there's a bunch of bad people who have decided that they want to take over the place of Rohan, and this is what's coming to them. By the way, they know due to spies and information that they probably shouldn't be hanging out in the main castle in the main seat of government. So they choose to become behaviorally modified, right? They know this big group of people are coming. They don't look like they're friendly. And they're going to move to their fortification called Helm's Deep. Helm's Deep has multiple fortifications that keeps the people safe in the moment that they're being attacked. So does this make sense? Well, that's fiction, right? So you're going, well, that's, okay, Dr. Dover, that's, that's fiction, that's a story, that's a movie. It's a great movie if you haven't seen it. Um, go see it, it's gory, but good and evil, great. So, real world. This is called Hochhosterwitz. For those of you who don't speak German, it's called Hochhosterwitz in English. Um, so, this is a fortress in the middle of Austria. You really have to know to look for it because it's kind of off in the distance by the train ride and it's notorious for its various gates. There are 17 gates, 
Each of these gates will kill you in a very distinct way. None of them the same. So if you've not been invited to the inner sanctum of Hochhosterwitz, you will die. Real story, real place. They actually created diagrams to show you how you're going to die. Each one of the gates has its own diagram showing the way one of them, if you stand on, right, you're, like you're knocking on the gate or trying to knock over the gate, the actual door trips and there's actually fire down below you, which is great because you burn, right? Um, there's another one that spikes come down from you. There's other ones that spikes come in from the sides. It's all kind of gory. Real, it's a place you can actually go view um, in the center of Austria. So real world, right? So not North Lord of the Rings, this is central Austria. By the way, the Austrians must have been Texans because they say it's never been conquered, right? Sounds like a Texan, right? But we've never been conquered. They've never been conquered. It may have to do with its strategic lack of importance, um, but nonetheless, it's one of the most fortified castles in all of Europe. So, so you say, well, what does that have to do with sales? Let's talk about people. How many of you have a ring? Anybody have a ring? Of those of you who have a ring, will you ever allow your ring to be not in your house anymore? Anybody want to get rid of their ring? I love my ring. My office is in the back of the house, and we're in Texas, so you all know we, we have bigger houses and small lot sizes, right? Because we need to be air conditioned, and so I work at the back of my house, and the worst thing that can happen to, happen to me during a day when I'm working at home is the doorbell will ring because, right, it might be somebody important, it never is somebody important, right, if it's in the middle of the day, but now I don't even have to get up. I just look at my phone and go, oh, it's a salesperson. By the way, in Texas, I don't know who's training the salespeople, Mark Hunter and some other sales trainers. If you all wanna go figure out, the door-to-door -door salespeople are all doing the same thing, and what they do is they go up, <clears throat> and they ring the doorbell, and then they walk back, way past the threshold. Now, I have a ring, this is great. What do I now know? Well, that's a salesperson, because they rang the doorbell and walked all the way back, because I think somebody's training them that when they open the door, what's gonna happen, right? No, the, what, no it hasn't. <laughs> these, these truly Texan and a veteran, she was thinking Ch -ch -ch. I love Texas, right? So, right, if I draw them, if I'm sitting by the door, the person can actually open the door, make the communication, shut the door. But if I walk way back, it's going to pull the person outside the doorway and actually engage them. They'll have to actually walk out to the threshold of their porch and begin a conversation. Except if I have a ring, I know it's a salesperson, I don't even answer the door. It's awesome. Packages, right? The, the porch pirates. Ha <laughs> ha, porch pirates, I got you on camera if you porch pirate me. So, right, this is behaviorally modifying us. We're changing the way we behave. We won't even answer the door anymore. We didn't answer it before anyway, but now we have a camera to make sure it isn't somebody that we really should go to the door for. Um, of course, Halloween night, my phone was going nuts and I wasn't home. GDPR. Europe changes everything, right? I have the right to be forgotten. I have the right to determine the information. This is a backlash in the European area. And by the way, worldwide, most corporations are having to have a GDPR strategy. This simply means that you have to ask me permission for me to give you my information or for you to retain my information. So these are current day adaptations to the modern economy. Just a couple of examples. So, Let's go back and think through this just for a second. So we have a 580% increase in the number of SDRs, but then as, as, as my friend Chris Beal will be able to tell you that he'll show you that he can increase that one SDR's capacity to 10 times what a regular SDR could do. Um, there are other friends of ours that are using automated bots we're gonna assume they do it well, but they could do a hundred times the emails, if not a thousand times the emails. And then we have AI bots for social. 
And so we have increased our capacity. Now, I, I, I'm only a professor, so I don't really understand math. Can somebody help me with math? Drew, can you help me with some math? Sure. Um, so we have a 6x performance times a 10x performance. Can you help me with the math there? That would be how much x capacity? A lot. 660x? So Chris is telling me 60x. But if we do the email where it's six, is it 6,000x emails we could send? By the way, if we had an increase in 60x to 6,000x buyers, because everybody's been hiring buyers like crazy, right? Those buyers, we just need more and more buyers. Oh, are we contacting the same number of buyers? Wait a minute, we're contacting the same number of buyers with 60x to 6,000x. Wow. So what is the buyer doing? The buyer is creating the equivalent of a whole cost of it. They're reacting. They don't want to be talked to. They're tired. They're being obliterated. By the way, how many of you salespeople have been being, how many of you have gotten bot emails? Anybody gotten bot emails lately? Put director in your title. You'll get them right away. Just, just, for, you know, just for a fun experiment for like maybe you know, 24 hours or 30 days, just put director or VP just for fun in your LinkedIn profile, and the bots will find you. I promise. You will all of a sudden get the most irrelevant communication you've ever seen in your life. And you'll get a lot of it. So this is what's happening. The buyer isn't the same. The buyer has shifted. The buyer is getting defensive. The buyer still needs to buy, but they're getting inundated with everything we're doing. So let's, let's kind of understand, let's take some historical context here. So we're in a know and do cycle, right? We learn about the buyer, then we do something. Then we learn about the buyer, and then we do. Because we do, right? Jason Jordan said that activities lead to outcomes. So we need to generate more activities, and then we'll develop more outcomes, right? That's the formula. It's the formula we've been using forever. It's the formula that is driving decreased performance and efficacy, according to CSO, and other sites, other groups that are studying this. So we're stuck in this know and do cycle. And we just keep doing it. Now, part of the reason we keep doing it is we don't know what else to do. Is that fair? We don't know what else to do, so we just keep doing it. We keep doing more of it. The customer keeps running away from us. So here are all the activities, and we know it'll present results. We know this, right? This is why we do this. We don't know anything different, so we keep doing it. So let's, let me give you some historical perspectives so we can kind of understand what happened? Remember, if you don't learn from history, what are you going to do? You're going to repeat it, right? So let me talk to you about what's called a suitcase farmer. A suitcase farmer occurred in the panhandle of Texas, Oklahoma, and then a little bit of Colorado. So what happened back then is that if you were willing to show up in Oklahoma at the courthouse, they would give you a tract of land, and you got to own that land, and you got to cultivate that land. You didn't have to pay for it, you just showed up. Well, so what happened is at first, right, this was to populate Oklahoma um, and to populate the panhandle of Texas, so, but Oklahoma was the primary area. So what happened is people went out and they didn't populate it, they actually took a suitcase, went out to Oklahoma, with their, right, with the change of clothes, went to the county courthouse, got their land, went to a farmer who actually had the mechanized equipment and said, plow my land, plant my field, and harvest my field. They got back on the train and went back east. When harvest came, they came back on the train with their suitcase, opened up their suitcase, put in the cash, and went back home. Sound like a great deal, right? So, this all worked great until the actual mechanization of the way they plowed the fields was based off a disc plow, and the result was they ended up with the biggest ecological disaster in our country's history. 
They overplowed the land. They tilled it not deep enough. They ruined the topsoil, and when the winds came, it blew the topsoil all the way down to Mexico. And within a few years, the land became fallow and they couldn't produce anything. Even worse, people died breathing in that black smoke because that's what the air looked like. All because of suitcase farmers and poor strategy. Do you see the parallel? So, today's suitcase farmers. First thing, we have a rise of inside sales. Second off, we have an explosion of SDRs. We can exponentially, we can actually, actually amplify that effort with sales stack. We've mechanized the fields. And by the way, who pays the consequence of the environment? Nobody does. We're gonna do more with tools capacity. We're in an exponential growth of enablement. And in this process, we're actually destroying the fields. Now, let's say you're a good actor. Let's say you're a really good actor. You actually behave. Does your competitor have to behave? How do you protect your white space from a suitcase farmer? You can't. If any of your competitors come in as a suitcase farmer, they destroy your field even if you're using appropriate tactics. So be careful, right? You may say, well, I don't do this. It doesn't matter if in your space you've got people coming in and plowing over your fields. They're causing the behavioral change that's going to create the lack of efficacy that we're hearing. This is the world in which we currently operate. So how do we stop this? What do we do? So the first thing is we've got to recognize we've got a problem, right? And we've got to stop and worry about becoming something different. It's not that our customers don't want to buy the solutions, because they do. It's the fact that they don't want to be contacted in the way that we're engaging them. But they do want to have solutions, because at the end of the day, we are producing solutions that are going to change the world, and that do need to be diffused into society, and we do need to sell. But customers don't want us to sell the way we're selling. So, we need to break that no and do cycle and do something different. And I've, I've decided to kind of incorporate one of our mottos here at UTD. And we don't, we don't talk about this as much as we have in the past. But the first thing you need to do is you need to be able to listen to the customer. By the way, listening to the customer, there's a lot of ways to listen without ever touching the customer. Um, then we need to learn. The next stage is listen. Learn, learn what's going on. There's some really good techniques. Ashley Welsh was here from Naked Sales, Somersault Innovation, talking about deep dives in, um, in discovery calls. Try and understand the business that your customer is in and, and understand how your solution can actually help that customer before you ever contact them. Can make you more relevant in today's space. Um, then you can lead forward with a solution. Now I contact you, I have context. And then the last piece is, then we scale. Most organizations are struggling with the fact that we actually start with scale instead of starting with the beginning. What I really like about um, what Jen was telling us earlier today is that they kept learning how to do it. Have they scaled yet? She's only added 15 people in three years. Have they scaled yet? Will they ever scale? They've actually scaled quite a bit. They've scaled by letting their people actually, they've scaled with the use of technology to amplify the voice, to amplify the connection in a way that's working. That's amazing. That's why I'm, I'm very excited to, to have had Jen come down and talk to us. So here are the three modern examples that I can see that this has happened and happened well. SoftLayer was the first company I ever saw that made me think about this a little bit differently. If you don't know who SoftLayer is, that's because our friends at IBM have bought them, and they were a division of IBM for a while, and now they're just IBM. But before IBM bought SoftLayer, SoftLayer went, and this is, this is going to our friend 
Um, Scott's point, they literally digitized their funnel. By the way, they were doing regular sales for years, and they went from about a million to about four million to about five million. Then they digitized their funnel, and they went from 11 million to about 100 million with about 10 salespeople. Let that sink in. 10 salespeople digitizing a funnel. They hit the market, they hit the message, and the people came to them. And the way their, their VP of sales talked to me, he said, we don't really sell, we digital it, we just tap them back into the funnel. We just see where they're getting struggling and we offer an assist and we tap them back into the funnel. Very interesting conversation, very early, very interesting concept of a company that grew to a level very fast with a very small and lean organization. Microsoft, the devil in experience and the experiences that Jen has had with her team, I think if you take the time to study what they've done, you'll be very, very impressed. And now, for my friends who will say yes, but I'm not Microsoft. I'm very excited that Beck Technologies is here in the room, and during the breakout session, if you'd like to go and listen to Stuart Carroll, the COO of Beck Technologies, he'll talk to you about how he's done it in a very small organization, and they're experiencing similar results, not, not 600% though, are we? Not quite, but still, we've got double digit there. They've got a multiplier effect going on at Beck Technologies by doing things innovatively and having a similar culture. So we've asked, actually asked Beck Technologies to come and do a breakout to kind of talk to you about this. So, um, and then at UTD Sales, we've had multiplier effects over the last year. By the way, this group, this organization, everybody in this room was brought here by a student. If you don't know that about the UTD sales model, um, I don't invite you to these unless you're a speaker. I, I have to go hunt the speakers down. The rest of you were all invited by one of our students who is learning how to sell. This event is 50% larger than the event last year this time. So they had a 50% increase, but year over year performance differential is 200% on a revenue basis. So can we congratulate the people who got us here? We are just experimenting with things like conversational intelligence, automating the funnel using digital assets. We're not we're not perfect at it, we're playing with some of these innovations. And we're experiencing two and 300% lifts year over year right now. We're an academic institution. I am the enablement person and Kiron, who was out at the front, is assisting us this year in doing some enablement work. But we primarily teach students and we're trying to innovate simultaneously. It's a little tough, that's our tertiary job. So, I'm going to go ahead and transition here and end with the following concepts. So here are the common threads that I think we found. First off, those organizations who are experiencing an amplifying effect are looking at the customer as the design point, not the sales organization as the design point. Um, if you'd like to discuss that a little bit later, we can talk about that, but I think definitely some of our guests today will talk to you about that as well. They also look at sales enablement. Now this is controversial for those in enablement, but this is, this is my thing and I'm gonna stick with it. There's sales enablement, capitalized sales, and then there's sales enablement, not capitalized sales enablement. Sales enablement, not capitalized, means that I'm trying to enable the organization that sells. And that's one way of doing sales enablement. It's a way, or there is revenue enablement or all sales on the 10K line, I'm gonna enable the way in which we generate growth and revenue. By the way, that incorporates marketing, that incorporates customer success, that incorporates product design, that incorporates, incorporates everything. It's a cohesive strategy that is bolder than just enabling a function, it's enabling revenue across the stream. Um, most of these organizations treat their human capital like it's actually capital. 
So they're not churning their organizational structure. They don't have a lot of turnover. They tend to keep their people. They tend to be worried about developing the asset of a sales organization and then investing in it and maintaining it instead of churning it over and, and, and causing. So definitely def that's, that's a relatable concept that, that my sales people are an asset to the firm, not a cost per se. And I invest in them. The other one is innovation is constant and continuous with most of these organizations. I think when you look at these organizations, they will say things like, we're on a journey, we're working towards, we're trying this, we're willing to fail, we're okay with failure, we iterate. They're not saying, hey, I've got it all figured out and here's how to do it. They wouldn't even say, I don't even know that they would use the words best practice. I think they would say, we're learning because we know the customer is moving. What I like to describe to everybody is what if, if I said to somebody, here's my target, right there, there's my target. Our friend Eli Cohen from Saleshood has made the point that in the old world, what we would do is we would say, all right, there's the target and the target has moved to here. So we're gonna come over here and spend three to four months designing a strategy and then we're going to develop the playbook and then we're gonna roll out the playbook. That takes about six to nine months, right? In most organizations. By the way, we're ready to hit here. Where's the customer now? It's over here. Customer's moved over here because it's behaviorally shifted while we were planning. So these organizations are agile. They're constantly looking at the innovation. They're constantly looking at behavioral change. I love what Jen said earlier today. It's, it's okay to question. It's okay to say, I'm not sure that's working anymore. And then go figure out what is because the people who are closest to what's happening are the people seeing the movement. Let them innovate. Let them bring innovation up. Don't always push innovation down. And by the way, go-to-market strategy has to transcend leadership. It has to be an organizational growth mindset culture where everybody is involved. So when you have leadership transition, it doesn't break everything down. So that's what I have today. If you'd like to follow me, LinkedIn is my best strategy. Um, if you'd like to follow what we're doing, you can follow hashtag UTD sales. And what I'd like to do now.